Thank you very much, Akim. Uh, it's wonderful to be here and it's a great pleasure. As the World Council for Renewable Energy, we do focus on the interplay between legislation, between social responsibility and between business developments. And yes, in the renewable energy sector, what we have seen is renewables are actually a fuel for the economy. They're also a fuel for jobs and they're also a fuel for innovation. But there is a serious role that government has to take. And that is to set the standard, to set the goals, and to make sure that the industry has the ability to meet that. Having worked with the electric utility industry in particular, we see it as a difficulty. It is the most capital intensive industry of all, and it straddles all of the fossil fuels, and it also is beginning to straddle other industries which typically are not involved in the electric electricity or energy production per se, such as electric transportation and the building industry. And we see these alliances as becoming increasingly important in people talking to each other and in realizing what an impact we can have in terms of how we use our resources much more efficiently, in how we harness the resources that we have, and in how there doesn't need to be a battle between the old and the new, but that they can seamlessly transition, such as utilities that are very dependent on coal, for instance, or on fossil fuel, can harness renewable energy and integrate it into the grid. Which can leads I just jump in? Can and have some of them done it? Yes, some of them have done it and are moving forward. For instance, even in California, as we have a goal of 30% renewable energy, by 2010, some of the utilities are moving very aggressively. Yes, pushed by legislation. Yes, underscored by very strong media attention and public education. Sometimes not very willingly, but they are moving forward to where they are incorporating the renewables such as wind and such as solar and such as geothermal into the grid and focusing on the distribution system, which is very critical as on-site power generation in terms of energy efficiency, combined heat and power, as well as solar, as well as smart grid and how you distribute those resources to minimize energy consumption and emissions, which is very, very critical. But we do see long-term policies being critical for the investment community to become involved and much more effective in how they deal with these policies and how long they stay in the market and how costs can progressively be decreased. And of course, we can see that as an example in Germany, but we can take that later. We will. Thank you very much, Angelina. Ashok, in himself, um, almost like an Encyclopedia Britannica of a, of a decade-long search for the transitions, whether we call them green economy or whether we call them as you have shaped also the agenda development alternatives. Ashok, if I can use you for a moment just to focus on this question that is also very much prevalent now where this concept of green economy has become a global conversation, perhaps a, a touchstone for rethinking many of the questions about development. You have spent your life looking for livelihood opportunities, more intelligent ways of employment, of income generation, of enabling particularly developing countries and poorer parts of society to have a share of the cake of economic growth, perhaps originally, or economic development. Where are the points of tension and where are perhaps also the examples that this is a false dichotomy when we say the green economy is something that comes later in development? And perhaps you might even pick one example, because I, again, I'm looking for Congress. I mean, comment on a program that has fascinated me simply by the sheer scale of it. And that is India's Rural Employment Creation Program, I think it is called, where 55 million people are guaranteed, I think, 100 days a year in terms of employment. And much of it is, in fact, uh, geared towards natural resource uh, projects at the local level. Seven billion dollars, if I understand correctly, in the Indian economy invested in a job creation program with a strong, let's say, objective of green economy. Are these examples that will shape some of the future directions of, of policy? Akim, I, you know, I, in, in order to put that in context, I think I have to go back to your very first question briefly. Um, why um, do we not do the right thing when we know it's to be done? And when we know the means for doing it. Well, there are four or five major reasons. One is, of course, um, vested interests. Uh, we've got huge um, investments in capital, in roads, in uh, factories, in power stations, 
And it's very, very difficult to suddenly find a way to change all that because we're embedded in them. The ultimate vested interest, of course, is the intellectual one, the one where we are in a mindset, a kind of paradigm that you were talking about this morning, where uh, the business as usual is so comfortable that we don't really want to change. It's known, for example, that uh, transport by lighter than aircraft, by airships, is about one hundredth the cost of road transport. But uh, do we do it? No, because road transport has been so heavily subsidized. Uh, in fact, the subsidies, we call them perverse subsidies because they not only subsidize the wrong things, but they subsidize the things that are actually destroying the planet, amount to some two trillion dollars a year right now in just four sectors, in, in the area of agriculture, energy, transport. Uh, these are areas that uh, we're destroying ourselves simply by paying people to do the wrong thing. Our taxes, our pricing systems, and you know, I would agree entirely with Georg's statement this morning that um, uh, we are in, in, in within visible distance of achieving a transition in thinking of business, but we won't be unless the prices are right, unless those prices reflect, because the business is in the business of profits. The social responsibility of business, Peter Drucker said, is to make profits. And it's right. But it's got to make profits within the law. And if the legal system permits it to make profits in ways that are not good for the earth, then obviously they're going to do that. But we do not have the mechanisms for conveying the information about what our children are going to have to pay in order for us to live the way we are. Do you have a good counterexample of where one has overcome that gap, in a sense, or that information? 